Okay, Amanda, thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you as your beloved children this evening to continue our study of uh, the Second Vatican Council and the liturgical reforms it calls us to. We humbly pray in the holy name of Jesus Christ for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us this evening in a special way that Sonia and I would be instruments of your grace to teach as you desire your beloved daughters to be taught and those watching at home so that we may grow in a greater knowledge and understanding of how the Holy Spirit has been leading and guiding the church in proper worship of you since the council. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I'm just going to take about 15 minutes with you, give or take, and I'm going to uh, use part of this book that was written by Father Blake Britton. I came to learn about this not too long ago because the Word on Fire Institute and Bishop Barron kind of promoted the book, and it's called Reclaiming Vatican II, what it really said, what it means, and how it calls us to renew the church. And what I'm going to focus on is the first chapter on the Para Council. Now, what are we talking about there? And most of what I say is coming from this book. There are a few places where I'll, I'll, I will insert my own thought as well, but by and large, what you hear, I'm taking from here. So this is plagiarism 101 in every way. Father Blake, thank you. I appreciate it. And I just agree with pretty much everything he says, just from my own experience and, of course, my own studies. I think he's a little bit younger than I am. Now, the church today, you know, we need to reclaim the legacy of Vatican II because it is the avenue for you, for me, for reforming and refocusing the church. It's why the Lord called it into existence. But first, I think we need to look at why the council needs to be reclaimed. We know, you probably better than me, because you've been living in parishes your whole life. I had a time of incubation in the seminary, that Vatican II, sorry, I just got this computer and the screen went blank, so I'm not used to the timing on it. I'll be careful. We know that it's a point of contention, the Second Vatican Council, and these tensions, you know, they arise from social media and other areas in the Catholic world with traditional and liberal Catholics disagreeing about Vatican II's supposed implications for liturgy, for catechesis, the church's relationship with the world, and so much more. Both sides are laboring under some serious misunderstandings and are responding to what Henri de Lubac, he was a, a French priest and made a cardinal as well, a contemporary of John Paul II, Benedict XVI. They're responding in their misunderstandings and misgivings to what Henri de Lubac calls the Para Council. And what that is, it's a poor caricature of what the council really taught and envisioned. So before we can reclaim the legacy of Vatican II, and Sony's going to dig into that for us this evening when it comes to the liturgy, we need to get a better handle on what led to such a massive misimplementation and misrepresentation of the Council's vision. Don't you think that's fair? If we got to know what we got to fix, we got to know how it broke, how it went wrong. So there's three aspects that we're going to focus on this evening in regards to the rise of the Para Council, right? The poor caricature of what the Council really taught and envisioned. And that's the para-council of the theologians, of the media, and of the age. Now, the Council of the Theologians. One of the biggest factors in the rise of the para-council was theologians setting themselves up as deputized interpreters of Vatican II and of church teaching as a whole. And boy, did I have to read some of these guys in graduate school. Wait. <laughs> then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, right, at the time of the council, he offers a clear summary of this phenomenon, and he was right in the middle of it. After the council, 
theologians increasingly felt themselves to be the true teachers of the church and even of the bishops. Moreover, since the council they had been discovered, moreover, since the, count, since the council, the theologians had been discovered by mass media and had captured their interest. For some of the theologians, the council documents failed to embody the radical changes they wanted. And in their opinion, the documents of Vatican II represented half-baked compromises. To me, that just smacks of arrogance where those theologians thought, we know better, sorry, Holy Spirit, what can we say? Now, the spirit of Vatican II. This was the solution to the theologians' perceived shortcomings of the Council's documents. You know, instead of adhering to the documents of the Council, some theologians opted to follow what they called the spirit of Vatican II. And setting aside the texts of the Council and focusing instead on the Council's spirit, a vast margin was left open for the question of how this spirit should subsequently be defined and room was consequently made for every whim. In lieu of promoting, and by the way, the council never speaks of the spirit of the council in this way, that it was made up. In lieu of promoting the documents as written and in cooperation with the magisterium, which I wish they would have done, certain theologians presented the teaching of the council through the lens of their own theological agenda foisting themselves on public opinion as authentic interpreters of the council. That's what makes us unique about being Catholic. We stand on the rock. It's the Lord who leads and guides the church, not us individually. We may add to her mission, but we are not the sole interpreting voice. Now, the fallout was significant, and its effects continue to this very day. While reflecting on the negative influences of seminary formation in the immediate post-conciliar years, Benedict XVI, he writes this, he wrote this, the long prepared and ongoing process of dissolution of the Christian concept of morality was, as I've tried to show, marked by an unprecedented radicalism in the 1960s. And for any of you that were around in the 1960s, did things go a little crazy, right? Absolutely. Indeed, in many parts of the church, conciliar attitudes were understood to mean having a critical or negative attitude towards the hitherto existing tradition, which was now to be replaced by a new, radically open relationship with the world. There were individual bishops who rejected the Catholic tradition as a whole, and sought to bring about a kind of new, modern Catholicity in their dioceses. So getting up to speed with the modern times, rather than the church evangelizing and Christifying the world, they had a view of letting the world creep into the church and defining who we are. It was backwards. The council, as interpreted by these theologians, became a counter-narrative to the official magisterium of the church, right? That teaching authority of the church. Unsurprisingly, a rift of resentment formed between the free-thinking academics in universities, seminarians, parishes, and schools, and the close-minded authoritarian hierarchy of the church. We can still feel the effects of this division in our parishes and institutions today. You know, it reached its apex when I was in the seminary it got so bad that Archbishop Flynn decided to start looking for a new rector. And he appointed Bishop Campbell to look for a new rector for the seminary. And the, the Archbishop met with all of us seminarians to listen to what was going on in the seminary, because there were many problems and he had had enough. And after listening to all of us and then having Bishop Campbell look for a new rector, they came into the chapel that day and the Archbishop was going to let us new, know who the new rector of the seminary was going to be. And you know who the new rector was? Bishop Campbell. Do you know how often bishops become rectors? Rectors become bishops, if that tells you anything of how earth-shattering that move was. And we were so excited because we had Bishop Campbell 
teach us the documents of Vatican II. When we were in minor seminary, we all stood up and we cheered so loud, even heaven shook. The stained glass windows in the building were shaking and all the teachers, they got up. They all knew they were gone. <laughs> they all knew they were on the chopping block because of what's taking place here where the theologians made themselves more important than the church. So that's number one. Number two, the council and the media. You know, we want to be in proper alignment between the Lord and his church down through our parish and our own lives. And we don't want to get out of that alignment and place ourselves at the top like some of these theologians did. They made themselves the church. Now, the council of the media. You know, it, for me, it wasn't until recently that I heard of fake news. How about you? We didn't talk about it a lot years ago, did we? It's kind of recent. Well, not when it comes to the council. The concept of fake news, it goes all the way back to Vatican II, according to Father Blake. In fake news, he defines its mass media outlets where they're prone to morph reports about current events to fit a specific narrative. And that's what it seems like they did during the council. You know, the council came up at an enticing time of societal revolution. And uh, two guys, Matthew Lamb and Matthew Levering, they say something enlightening about the media's role in interpreting the council, and I quote, never before was an ecumenical council of the Roman Catholic Church so extensively covered and reported by the modern news media as Vatican II. The impact of this coverage was pervasive and found in its portrayal of the council in the ideological categories of liberal and conservative. I really don't like those labels. When I was in the seminary, the faculty viewed me as a conservative right-wing yehu. And now as I get older, the younger clergy view me as a liberal nut job. I'm the same guy. I don't like these categories. The council was dramatically reported as a liberal or progressive accommodation to modernity, right? Letting the world into the church that aimed to overcome Catholicism's traditional conservative resistance to modernity. Journalists of the print and electronic media flocked to Rome. None of them, or few of them, had any expertise in Catholic theology. And so they were dependent upon popularized accounts of the Council's deliberations and debates offered by Pariti. Those were like uh, theological consultants to the Council. One of uh, my next-door neighbor, her uncle was a priest, and he was one of the Council Pariti. And he actually gave me an autographed picture Actually, his niece did because he had died of St. John the 23rd. He signed it at the council and it got passed on down to me. And theologians with journalistic skills. So, there's two important points. The media became a mouthpiece for theologians speaking what they wanted to speak and promoting their own interpretations and agendas, which we've covered. But then secondly, the media's parceling of the church into liberal and conservative factions. For you and for me, ladies, and everybody watching at home, the church's discourse must transcend the limiting dichotomies of liberal and conservative. We shouldn't be in just one camp. Truth must be the church's only concern, and not just truth, but beauty and goodness, not appealing to a Gallup poll or appeasing a political faction. And secondly, if we are to reclaim Vatican II and continue striving towards authentic renewal, we have to broaden our horizons and break out of the restrictive categories of liberal and conservative. Now, how do we do that? Well, there's proper and, are, and there are improper ways to practice Catholicism. We're going to use a couple fancy words here. In order to discern appropriate forms of orthodoxy, which is right belief, typically we might associate orthodoxy with conservative and strict. No, it just has everything to do with right belief and orthopraxis, orthopraxis, which is right practice, putting into action, I suppose, what we believe. For you and me, can you name your trigger? What sets you off in the church? Is it the, the new, young, strict, rigid priest? 
Is it the older, freewheeling and dealing liberal priest? What's your trigger? Do you have a trigger? I was probably your trigger. <laughs> we all have triggers, right? <laughs> but we have to be free of those triggers, right? Because they can be so uncharitable and we can be presumptuous of others' opinions and motives. It's like, you don't fit into my camp. Oh, you poor evil person, I'll pray for you, right? We have to be careful about that. In the end, this can only be accomplished through love. We can't judge the other. We have to love them and we can't be presumptuous about their motives. Only the Lord can judge their heart. Right? So in other words, rather than just simply listening to the media, listening to the theologians, for you and me, we've got to go to the source. And that's what we're trying to do when we gather here. Because then that's not threatening. It's not bashing one side or bashing another side. We're just trying to listen to the Lord as revealed by the Holy Spirit leading and guiding the church. Lord, what do you desire? I don't see how that's threatening at all. And the last thing that I want to bring up, the third part of the paracouncil is the Council of the Age. The Second Vatican Council was in peril from its period, which was man-centered. And we still seem to be in that epoch today sociologically minded and spiritually horizontal. Everything's staying here, right? These words from the Dominican scholar Aidan Nichols lucidly capture the third and final component of the Paracouncil's rise. The years immediately following Vatican II were characterized by a spirit of freelance experimentation, rebellion against authority, rejection of tradition, political upheaval, tense international relationships, and rapid technological development. Can any of you think of any freelance experimentation and goofiness within the liturgy from when you were growing up to after the council? I've heard of crazy things like Bishop Barrett once said a priest came in on the procession riding a motorcycle at the beginning. Should I start doing that or would that just rub you the wrong way? I don't know how to ride a motorcycle, so I'd probably run into someone in the pews, right? You know, there's, there's a certain goodness to the way things have been structured so people can know what to expect because they come to encounter the Lord and not be jolted because they don't know what one week is going to bring to the next. Now, this mentality of seeking novelty, trying out new structures and redefining previously accepted norms certainly bolstered the widespread acceptance of paraconciliar thinking. In an age when doing unconventional things was heroic and casting off the shackles of, antiqu of antiquity was a virtue, certain theologians' interpretations of Vatican II appeared to be yet another way of sticking it to the man. People began to see Vatican II as a signal that even the church was ready to change rather than changing the world and how do we do that? How is the Lord going to do that through the church? No wonder the Paracouncil's agenda was welcomed in so many quarters, coinciding as it did with the spirit of the age. Now, lastly, there was the conservative reaction to the Paracouncil. And uh, actually, Father Blake, he, he quotes Sir Isaac Newton, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now that was speaking in regards to physics was Newton, but I think it also applies to spiritual physics, if you will, like Bishop Barron likes to use all the time. That reaction has been growing and growing to this very day. And it's being called radical traditionalism. And now, I know I don't have a way to get through the rest of this, so I'm just going to ad lib here. Part of why we're meeting is because Pope Francis is trying to address this reaction to the Paracouncil through the motu proprio that he had uh, come out with last summer in regards to how we are to celebrate and use the old Latin Mass. Just taking a look at where things have started to move too far 
in the other direction because people were, grew to be so disenfranchised and angry with the para council and the goofiness that came out of it. And I'll leave it at that. So now we're gonna let Sonia come in here and help us to just kind of understand a little bit more about where we're gonna go with this as far as the liturgy in our parishes. And I'm excited for that, okay? Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Father. Um, I really appreciate that because also I, I didn't live through that time um, and was not, uh, I, I, my experience is much more limited, so I'm so grateful for Father's intro there. Um, and also I just want to extend a thank you to all of you for coming tonight and also all of those joining us online. Um, again, I'm just so grateful that you took the time to be here and to watch, so thank you so much. Um, uh, so I'm really excited to dive in, just kind of maybe as a segue um, from what Father was talking about. Um, uh, well, I guess, again, what brought me back to the Mass after I had been kind of shopping around at different denominations was the liturgy. Um, and after college, I had an opportunity, actually when I was living in Poland, um, to be involved in the music ministry in a very small little English-speaking church and, and we had a guitarist and me, and sometimes it was only me singing a cappella. So I had the opportunity to pick out the hymns and everything. We had these old, outdated hymnals that someone had shipped over from the US, I guess. Um, and so I would just pick songs, and usually I would just pick songs that had tunes that I knew I was confident enough to sing on my own and I wouldn't mess up. Um, uh, in front of everyone. So um, I just remember that I, I sang, so I was picking songs, and generally they were just very familiar tunes. Um, and I sang one of them, which is called Sing a New Church into Being, which was popular in some places, but it's not in our hymnals anymore. Um, and we'll get into why. Um, and I just remember that there was this uh, young priest and uh, he wasn't Polish, I won't say what country he was from, um, but he didn't, also didn't really have a lot of tact, so he just said, you know, like, you really shouldn't be singing that music at mass, you know, and kind of went off, and I was like, oh, okay, I, I don't really understand why, but, um, and then he offered to give a lecture to the musicians or anyone interested in that little parish about liturgy and, um, and, and, and what Vatican II was talking about here. And so I went to the lecture, even though I was like, I don't really know how this is going to go because he wasn't, didn't seem very nice. But I learned a lot um, and everything from like architecture to, to different styles of music um, and just talking about how some music that has come up in the church partially because of this para council is actually not helpful um, during the mass. And that was kind of my start of realizing, wow, there is a lot more here that I don't know anything about. I didn't even really know that there were documents in Vatican II or what Vatican II was really about. Actually, I had some friends in college who, um, again, were falling into this camp of, uh, you know, Vatican II is just, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. Anything Vatican II, everything before Vatican II was good and now after Vatican II is bad. Um, but again, as Father was saying, I don't, like these people who are saying Vatican II is bad hadn't even read the documents. Just like those who were creating this peer council um, to push their own agendas also had not read the documents. Or if they had read them, they were intentionally <laughs> saying different things based on their own agendas. So I was kind of in this state of confusion, just thinking, wow, I'll, people I trust are saying that, no, no, Vatican II is just bad. Um, anything before Vatican II is good, so we should just go back to pre-Vatican II. It was actually when I went to the Augustine Institute and studied, um, first of all, the Catechism, which is a fruit of Vatican II and those documents and scripture, but then also just the documents themselves from Vatican II. And I just thought, wow, these are amazing and so beautiful and this is really because okay we can all agree i think 
that something needed to be done. Like the, the old, the extraordinary form of the mass is beautiful. I love it. It's amazing. And so many saints came out of praying that mass, right? For a thousand years and more. So, um, wow, we, I just invite you also to just hold that in deep respect. And if you ever have an opportunity to go, take it, you know, it's, it's beautiful to experience. However, there were some things um, that did need to be changed. And um, Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, and John Paul II, like these, Henri de Lubac, these people, these fathers of the council realized that, and they wanted to create um, a, a balance. So there is a balance here between um, the one extreme, which is like only pre-Vatican II is good, and the other extreme, which is like the para-council. But there is a happy balance in the middle, and that is actually what Vatican II is telling us. Um, so we are going to dive into that. Um, and I just also um, want to speak about all of these things with the utmost reverence and love, as Father was saying, for everyone who has been a part of the church in, in, in church music in any way, just because, okay, we know that there were some people on one end of the extreme in the parish council trying to drive certain agendas, um, but I think most of them have had, had the best intentions, okay? Maybe not some, but I think most did. And all in all, I think all church musicians, pretty much all church musicians, right, are just, were doing the best they could with what they had. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that because we just haven't had the resources until recently to implement these things that Vatican II is asking of us. And that's kind of a result of what historically has been 50 years of chaos after every council, <laughs> okay? So this is not something to be alarmed at or feel guilty about or ashamed or be pointing fingers. It's really, um, I think people genuinely have always been doing the best they could with what they have. And now we're in an amazing time where we do have resources to start implementing these things after this, I, I, you know, they, you can, I, I don't know where to look. If I find some resources, I'll let you know. Um, but our professors have, would say at the AI, yeah, that they're usually after every council, it was a little bit crazy for about 50 years because they're trying to implement those changes and they don't come quickly, right? So this is a global church. And if, for example, we have now permission to uh, do these, the texts of the mass in the vernacular, well, it's gonna take a little bit of time <laughs> to translate those and, and be implementing these in all of the churches all around the world. So um, just to, to uh, speak with gratitude and reverence and love for all church musicians ever who really, truly are trying to do the best um, that they can uh, with what they have. So, but also at the same time, now especially that we have these resources, let's, let's begin, right? S small baby steps. Um, I know when I was like studying some of this, I thought, oh, this is, like, and Father and I were talking about just uh, acknowledging the ideal, um, which is a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> Because it's like, wow, uh, it really has been a little bit crazy in the last 50 years. So um, what the church is asking, we, we've got a ways to go, but um, we, we'll, we'll start somewhere. We'll start somewhere, and, and that's beautiful, right? Because uh, we're just going to take baby steps. Um, and again, it's all about, like we talked about last time, uh, this is all about making Mass more prayerful, making Mass it already is beautiful, it already is prayerful, but just really helping people to enter into the liturgy um, to the fullest, right? So to exercise our royal priesthood, their royal priesthood, in uniting ourselves um, with Christ's offering at Holy Mass for the redemption of the world, right? So this is, our, this is the goal, um, to enter more deeply into what's already there um, and just conforming more um, fully with what the church is asking of us. Um, and, and, the more, and just knowing the more fully that we enter into the liturgy, the more fully that we can help people um, exercise their royal baptismal priesthood in offering themselves united to Christ at Holy Mass, the more we can transform culture and transform the world, right? So that's the goal here. Um, that's the goal. So let us uh, 
dive right in. Um, I just want to apologize in advance, especially for those who are watching at home, um, which I sent out an email and I'm hoping I, I will put this PDF in, in the comments section on this video so that people watching later can also follow along. Um, the numbering system on the PDF is terrible. <laughs> and I'm so sorry about that because I just, something with, I, I guess I'm not very good with uh, computers and something really got messed up. So we'll just, we'll just do the best we can. Okay, um, a great place to start with anything in regards to our faith is Holy Scripture, okay? So I just have this little collection here of some uh, places where we can find music in the scriptures. So this would be your first page of your uh, PDF, which is page 19A. <laughs> so um, that's the first page for tonight. And of course, the place where we find so many words about music and singing in the scriptures are the Psalms, right? Because these are meant to be uh, sung prayers, right? And these, it's so beautiful. These Psalms are the prayers that Jesus would have prayed, right? So Mary and Joseph would have been teaching Jesus these prayers, praying them together. Um, and it's, it's kind of cool. I, I didn't include that here, but if you look in, in most Bibles, they'll say, you know, to the tune of the lilies, or, you know, this is a certain kind of song to the tune of such and such, uh, you know, a Psalm of David to this tune. Um, so it's just, and we, and unfortunately we don't know any of those tones or tunes anymore. Um, they've been lost in history and in time. Um, but it's, it's beautiful to know that people have been singing these literally for millennia. Um, so, for example, Psalm 105, to sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works, right? So as musicians in Holy Mass, whether we're playing or singing or, or in the part, con part of the congregation, we're singing to him, singing praises to him, and telling of all his wonderful works, okay? Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Um, I just, I love this so much. Praise him with the trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp, with timbrel and dance, strings and pipe. Okay, and also we didn't have the organ back then, um, but I would say that pipes <laughs> come in at that point. Okay, praise him with strings of pipes, with loud cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Okay, um, and this is going a little bit out of order here, but in Revelation, it's so beautiful. Um, John says, and I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters, like the sound of thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpers playing on their harps. Okay, so this is uh, like the heavenly voices sound like music, okay? And they sang, they sing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. So the, the angels and saints are singing um, in heaven constantly, right? They're in the heavenly liturgy. And actually part of the reason why we want to do the liturgy as the church is asking of us is because we are literally entering into the heavenly liturgy, okay? Liturgy is not some, man, and when I say liturgy, okay, we're talking about Holy Mass, all right? So liturgy also extends out to, for example, like the prayers that Father prays, um, or monks and nuns, we have morning prayer, lauds, and, you know, the hours of the day, all the way down to Vespers, evening prayer, and night prayer. Um, some of them even get up in the middle of the night, okay? The poor clares I was with, yeah, we would get up <laughs> in the middle of the night to pray matins, okay, the office of readings, at midnight. Okay, so sanctification of the whole day. Um, uh, where was I going with this? Oh, because we enter into the heavenly liturgy. So this is what is going on all the time in heaven, right? So constantly the angels and saints are singing the praises of God. The holy heavenly liturgy is happening constantly. And we have this privilege while on earth, right? During Holy Mass, our time stops and we enter into God's time and we are participating with angels and saints. So if, I don't know if some of you watched that video of the veil removed. If you haven't, I highly recommend to look that up. And um, uh, and I, I'm a little bit, I laugh a little bit each time because the graphics are a little bit, uh, a little bit funny, but they are so, it's so beautiful. It, it shows the reality of mass, which is that, first of all, Jesus acts through the priest, okay, to consecrate the bread and the wine into his body and blood. Um, and then the angels and saints are literally all present here, right? So every single Mass that has ever been, 
ever is now, anywhere throughout the world, and ever will be, the angels and saints, Jesus, okay, and the angels and saints are all present. Okay, your guardian angel is present with you. Um, your confirmation saint, your favorite saints, whatever, they are all with you. And it's, it's so amazing to keep that in our minds, right? And, and to realize, wow, Our Lady is here every single Mass with us, okay? And of course, Jesus comes. Um, but they're outside of time. They're in eternity. And that's what we're going to be able to do as well when we reach the heavenly gates and are, you know, admitted into heaven. <clears throat> we will literally be worshiping God forever. I mean, eternal rest, grant unto them, O oh Lord. Rest, our true rest, is actually worship. Okay, that's why Sunday is our day of rest. Okay, so we don't, we try not to work during that day. We try to do holy leisure together with our families by maybe eating together more, playing board games, or just spending time. <clears throat> Excuse me. But our true rest, our true leisure is worship. So that's what heaven is going to be like, united to God forever, worshiping him forever, right? So we're going to be able to also um, to be present at every single holy mass on earth, okay? Amazing, right? This is reality, right? This is our faith. Um, this is truth. So that's also just part of this humbling re realization. Like when I heard this, I just thought, oh my gosh, okay, never again can I think, oh, I just want to do this song because I like it, or oh, I love to hit that high G up there, um, <laughs> and this feels really good, or whatever the case may be. No, like this is entering into the heavenly liturgy. I am so privileged and so blessed to be able to enter into this amazing reality, which is already happening, right? So. Um, and we're going to get into a little bit more of that, so hold that thought, okay? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm just going to get some water. That's why I brought this here. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. All right, and this, uh, I, I just had to include Psalm 57 in here. I find this so moving um, because, I mean, some of the Psalms, I think Psalms 22 and some other ones, they specifically... Uh, how, how do we say this? Uh, foretell? No, I don't know. Uh, foreshadow? Um, Jesus' death uh, on the cross. Um, so it just, he's, he's, so we can imagine him in Psalm 57 um, saying, you know, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. I, in the shadow of thy wings I take refuge. I cry to, the God, most, to God most high. Okay, he, all of these things. Um, but then it especially gets intense here. I lie in the midst of lions that greedily devour the sons of men. Their teeth are spears and arrows. Okay, he was speared, right? Their tongues are sharp swords. Um, uh, and he praises them. Okay, uh, but it's so beautiful. Okay, uh, I love this so much. So turning the page to verse 7 of Psalm 57. And in some translations, like I think the breviary, it says, My heart is ready, O God, my heart is ready. My heart is steadfast, my heart is ready. I will sing and make melody. Awake my soul, awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. Okay, so this psalm is um, often seen as something like uh, that Christ would have been praying on the cross. Uh, and I, I just think it's so beautiful, right? His heart is ready. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody. Awake my soul. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. Which for me, that's like, wow, this is just about the birth of the church. Okay, so his heart is ready. He's going to be singing. The dawn is going to come, right? So Easter is like the dawn, the rising of the sun in the east, the Orients. Um, and he will awake the dawn, he will awake the new creation, the new, the, the church, he's going to give birth to the church, um, or Mary will, under his cross, you know, he, he gives uh, John to Mary. I will give thanks to thee, O Lord, among the peoples, I will sing praises to thee among the nations, for stead, thy steadfast love is great to the heavens, thy faithfulness to the clouds, be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let thy glory be over all the earth. So that for me is amazing, because He's like dying on the cross, and that's like his last song, okay? But the, we'll, which will turn into like uh, the dawn, which is his new song, his new creation. Um, just amazing, 
musical imagery there. Which, and then at Mass, that's all the more inspiration for us, right? Because we are participating in his sacrifice, uniting ourselves to him when we receive him. Um, so we're also on the cross with him, dying on the cross, dying to ourselves, right? Dying to sin, and then rising with him um, to go out and be his hands and feet in the world. All right, so that's just beautiful musical imagery there from the Psalms. Um, in Second Chronicles, we have the duty of the, this is in the temple now, the, it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. When the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, um, for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. Okay, and then the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud, and the priest could not even stand to minister, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Okay, again, just amazing. Um, from Isaiah, we see, and this is uh, where we get our holy, holy, holy um, God, Lord God of hosts. Um, we see Isaiah seeing that above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, and two he covered with his face. Okay. He has all these wings, the seraphim. This is a special kind of angel, which is like the flaming ones. Okay, and the angels called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So at Holy Mass, when Father says, um, Oh no. <laughs> and with the angel, the, with all the angels we acclaim, or something, uh, yeah, I'm very sorry that I don't have it memorized. Um, but that's where it comes from, right? So with the angels, you know, the choir of angels, we acclaim, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. You know, heaven and earth are full of his glory. Hosanna in the highest. All right, so that's also coming from Holy Scripture. It's right there. And then beautiful here in Luke, again, we see uh, the angel multitude. And again, I cannot read this passage. I don't know how many of you are, like, super familiar with Handel's Messiah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm... Uh, very tempted to just sing it. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I, I don't, can I do it? Um, and the translation might not be exactly right. Uh, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. Something like that. Praising God and saying, Then it's the choral piece, and it's, but that recitative, right? I cannot read those passages in Luke without, like, Ooh, I cannot. I just, during Christmas, I just, I cannot read them without hearing that in my head, okay? That's also the power of music, right? So there's a reason why we put, uh, this, like, while the song, while, why the psalms were also sung so that we could remember them easier, that they're playing in our heads while we go about our day, um, and we're, we're also going to get into that because the antiphons at Mass, I find, they're, they're meant uh, to stick with us throughout the day, throughout the week, right? And if, and if we do them enough, they will become familiar to us, right? So the Psalms will be present in our minds and hearts, um, which is amazing. Like, we, it would be great if we could put more scripture in our heads. <clears throat> I can't remember who, who it was recent. I don't know, it's saying that, you know, like the more junk like, what we put into our minds is going to be what comes out of our mouth, right? What comes out of our hearts. So if we're filling up our minds with junk, that's what's going to be coming out of our mouth. That's what's going to be in our hearts. So the more we can fill our minds and hearts with scripture, the better, right? Like, we want to be able to say with Mary, just spontaneously quoting the Psalms, you know, like, blessed be God forever, you know, or like, my soul... Um, uh, magnifies the Lord, you know, he has done great things for me, and holy is his name. I mean, we want to be able to, because that was comprised of psalm texts, right? So she probably had all the psalms memorized, okay? But just, she was able to just put that together spontaneously. But the Holy Spirit can work with what's in our brains, right? So if we just have junk, and I'm not saying you guys have junk, but just, well, you ladies, have, <laughs> or anyone at home, okay? But I, okay, right? So if you're listening to a certain kind of music or whatever, um, or TV shows, or, you know, the Holy Spirit can only work with it's with what is in our memory, right? So if we don't have a whole lot of good stuff up there, what's he going to work with, okay? Okay, 
No more like Drake. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, but anyway, so there's so many, and there are so many more examples of music. Um, and actually, I guess mm, I had a couple. No. Well, a couple more. Oh, good. A couple more. Okay. Sorry. We're going to skip a couple pages to 21A, if you want to follow along, um, to actually, uh, so like Holy Mass and Liturgy um, and, and the life of the very early church, right? So this is um, St. This is Paul um, in First Colossians and then Acts. So these were just the very early days of the church um, where art and singing is a part of their lives, okay? So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God, okay? So psalms, we know what those are, but hymns and spiritual songs, right? So already there were hymns and spiritual songs being composed. All right, or we, we assume, um, uh, which is so beautiful. And some of the, for example, uh, oh, and there are some canticles. And every day, I, I haven't been praying the liturgy of the hours for a while. So, but for they're like, I know in First Peter, there's a special canticle. Ephesians, there's a canticle. Um, and of course, I cannot, uh, or but one, for example, is like uh, Philippians canticle. Um, and God, who did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but rather he humbled himself uh, and became like a slave. Uh, you know, this, anyway, there are these passages in scripture that are now used in the Liturgy of the Hours as, um, along with the Psalms, to be sung because the way the words are in scripture is written like a poem, or it's, it's definitely more singable than the prose, right? Um, so there are times in scripture where the, the writer just goes into song or poetry, right? Okay, so um, just so beautiful. Um, so already there's so many examples in scripture that music is so important. Okay, and just one more. In Acts 2, 4, 6, uh, and day by day, or 2, verse 46, sorry. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. Okay, so breaking the bread is the mass in their homes they took part of food and with with glad and generous hearts praising god and having favor with all the people um oops i guess there's nothing about music there well maybe there is in the context sorry about that anyways you can see that there's breaking bread happening all right sorry about that but the lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved okay sorry about that i must have put in the wrong verse oh well all right um the next thing that i i just want to uh go into, so we've got all of these things in, this, in scripture where music is so important, right? And we've, we've been talking about how that fits into the liturgy. Um, the next text, which is so important, and, and, and in Vatican II is really the core, okay? Um, or the core of it has come from Vatican II and, and previous documents and the saints and scripture is, okay, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And this one came out in 1992. John Paul II, St. John Paul II, the Great, was the one, the um, Pope who put this out. Uh, I know that it's like so big, <laughs> okay? And this is actually the biggest version. I actually have a smaller, there's a smaller copy that doesn't look so intimidating. But this one, this green version, is amazing because so the catechism part actually stops like right here-ish. And then the rest of it is like index of citations. You can look up all of the different scripture passages, okay, that are included in, in this catechism. Um, and then all of the different Vatican documents that are cited, uh, the councils and synods of the past, saints, popes, canon law. Okay, so just for nerdy people like me, this is really very exciting. There's a really great index and also a really awesome glossary. So again, uh, this was like the core text of my master's. I mean, Holy Scripture was the first core text. Then it was this. Um, and of course, and that was very intense study for two years. And I really feel like I just scratched the surface. Like, I just feel like this is a lifelong study. But something beautiful you can do is just read one paragraph a day. And that's very doable. And, um, and actually, if you, if, you, if you start reading this and you think, oofda, this is... Too much. Do not worry. There's something called 
there are two other resources. There's a compendium, which is like a summary version of this, and it's much, much smaller, um, and much, much more uh, readable. It's in a more like simple and direct um, format. But then also a really great resource is what's called the UCAT, which is made, uh, and there's a UCAT and a DUCAT, okay? And the UCAT is like the youth catechism, and then the DUCAT, I think, does more of like the church's social teaching. Um, but even the UCAT is like a summary of the, this catechism, and that is so great, it's such a great resource. I was reading it in help preparing for my confirmation students, uh, and I was thinking, wow, if I read this and really memorized all of this stuff, I would be so much more able to answer people's questions about the faith, or just, I don't know, it's just, it's so clear, it's concise, um, and it's made for young people, and so it has lots of fun little illustrations and quotes and things around the edges, which is very fun. Um, so I just encourage you, uh, it's very interesting, even before I felt called to get my master's, I really felt the Lord drawing me to like dive into this, and I was like, what? <laughs> you know, where do I even start? How do I even begin? And thank God I, you know, was able to be guided through that at the AI, but honestly, it's so beautiful. It's like spiritual reading, and as Catholics, we should really know this, okay? In our hearts, we should be, because it's got so much scripture and the saints and the councils and everything. Um, so I just, I really recommend that to you. Um, what I wanted to do, um, okay, is kind of show you, first of all, the structure. <clears throat> so this does not have a page number, but just back, uh, if you are on page uh, 21A, back one page, and you'll see what looks, I mean, these are just like, this is copied right out of the catechism. So do you see that? Okay. And the reason why I wanted to do this is because it's just important to also be familiar with the structure of this book. So in the catechism, um, the paragraphs, all the paragraphs are numbered. Okay, so in Holy Scripture, because we're often just looking so closely at one little tiny part, it's every single verse has its own number. But in the, in the Catechism, every paragraph has a number. Um, so those are in, in bold, like 1153, okay, under words and actions, that is the paragraph number. And then you'll see that there are these numbers on the side, like 53, 1100, 103, and 1127. Those are corresponding paragraphs in the catechism that, so if you're uh, like 53, the form of a dialogue through actions and words. Okay, so maybe it's in paragraph 53, maybe it's gonna talk about dialogue more or words and actions or something. Um, so these are corresponding paragraphs that will tell you more about that particular line of the catechism. So this is kind of, this is fun because if you're reading and you say, okay, so there's something more, you know, in paragraph 1127, so I can go back to 1127, read that and see what that says. So it kind of can lead you on a, a fun adventure <laughs> through the catechism, kind of, kind of see where you end up. Um, also um, on the bottom, okay, is all of the footnotes. And I don't know if you're like me, but I also, it drives me crazy, or no, yeah, it drives me crazy if the citations are at the back of the book. That just makes me so mad because I'm like, I don't wanna look back there every single time that there's a citation, okay? But here you can see um, all of the things they're referencing. So again, for a nerdy person like me, I like to know where things are coming from. So for example, um, on page 299, okay, down at the bottom, you see there, there's quite a big list of citations, okay? It's like 20 through, through 26. And the first one, number 20, is the SC stands for Sacrosanctum Concilium. So that's a document that we, we were studying in our last class. Okay, that's the sacred constitution from Vatican II on the liturgy. So we were taking a lot of um, a lot of our, our quotes and those segments, those passages from the church documents was from Sacrosanctum Concilium. Now, I do not expect that you remember all of these things. I know that these down here, uh, especially 
if you are unfamiliar with the church documents, they're not going to mean a whole lot to you. But it is cool that you can see, for example, um, the scripture citations as well as saints. Okay, so again, I don't expect that you are going to be, uh, you know, I, I, it's not required. You don't have to be like studying this, but I just invite you and, and want you to know how it works. Okay, because this can be a great, because the catechism is a great reference. You can read it straight through. Okay, it's structured in like a progressive format. You can read it straight through, or you can use it as a reference, like an encyclopedia or a dictionary. If you want to see what the, like, what does the church say about immaculate? Immaculate conception. Okay, paragraph 490 to 93. Great. Okay, so if you're having a, a question in the church about um, adoption, okay, you can look that up and see what the church says about adoption. Or, uh, let's see, what else? Nature, okay. Um, the nature of women, for example or Noah. Okay, so if you want to know what the church has said and is saying about different topics, you can look it up in here and you don't have to read the whole thing. But I remember when I was first uh, also just learning about the church, I was like, you know, about a certain issue or something, um, like homosexuality. What does the church say about that? I didn't know. So I looked it up. Okay, this can be so helpful for us, especially um, when we have doubts or questions and God wants us to have those questions and to explore deeper because it can only deepen our faith, right? So if we go to the right places for information and realize the wisdom and duty of the church, it can only deepen our faith, okay? We don't want to be living in blind, just following like blind sheep, all right? Okay, that is a lot on that. So I just want to, first of all, uh, turn your attention to paragraph 1156, okay? So under singing and music, all right, and this next sentence, okay, blew my mind, okay, and, and really changed my perspective, okay? It says, and this is now coming from Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the Vatican II document we have been studying. The musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value. Okay, whoa, what? The musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value. Okay, it's such a treasure that we don't even know how valuable it is. We can't even estimate the value of it. It's inestimable, okay? Now, this is this next statement, okay? Greater than, even than that of any other art. What? Greater than any other art. Okay, and this, again, is in no way putting down paintings, okay, sacred art, sculpture, okay, art, did I say architecture, stained glass, all these things, in no way, right, those are so important and we need them, okay, they're so necessary, right, the beauty of the space is so important because that brings us to prayer, especially in times when people could not read, Paintings, stained glass windows, all of these things were so important because they told us the truth of the faith to those who couldn't read or those who did not have an education, all right? And still now, we need that beauty to lift our hearts to God. However, again, the musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value, greater than that of any other art, okay? So, the main reason for this preeminence is that Okay, as a combination of sacred music, okay, so again, we can be, we can transcend time, we can transcend the problems that we're having in our lives, or maybe it can bring healing to us, just with music alone, right? Not even with words, okay, with music alone. Um, so much power and so much beauty, and this is a vehicle of the Holy Spirit, right? Just music alone, however, uh, the main reason for the preeminence is that as a combination of, again, that sacred music, which is transcendence on its own, and words, okay, and most often, especially these texts that are given to us in Holy Mass are scripture. Again, when we read scripture, Jesus is present. When we sing scripture, Jesus is present, okay? Um, so, 
when it's scripture plus this transcendent power of music, wow, that's why it's so important because it's not just, okay, paintings. It's a depiction of Jesus and a story in his life, which is so important, again. But scripture is his word, okay? Not what we think his word looked like, not what we think the word was, but his word exactly, right? It's the inspired word of God. Um, so, when is a combination of sacred words and sacred music and words, it forms a necessary or integral part of the psalm liturgy. The composition and singing of inspired psalms, often accompanied by musical instruments, were already closely linked to the liturgical celebrations in the Old Covenant. Okay, the church continues and develops this tradition. So in the temple, the psalms were being sung. Okay, that's again, praise the Lord with timbrels, praise him with horn and pipe, praise him with the sound of music, right? And again, this is quoting, uh, or maybe I don't know if I had that one. Um, but address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. Okay, and from St. Augustine, he who sings prays twice, right? Because music brings an extra element that elevates the speech. Again, we talked about this last time. There are things that just cannot be said when we just speak, right? So the music brings an extra element. It's elevated speech. It elevates scripture even to like a higher transcendent point because that music is communicating something to our soul which is even beyond what the actual words are saying themselves okay amazing going on song and music fulfill their function as signs and a matter all the more significant when they are more closely connected with the liturgical action according to three principal criteria all right so one beauty expressive of prayer Right, so again, the whole reason why we're doing the liturgy at all, why we're doing music is because we want to, to the best of our ability, help people enter into the liturgy, enter into prayer, enter into that offering of ourselves united to Christ, to eternal Father for the redemption of the world, okay? So beauty expressive of prayer. The unanimous participation of the assembly at the designated moments, Okay, so all of the parts of the Mass which everyone is to sing, um, it should be unanimous participation, right? So like the Mass parts and things. Um, in this way, they participate in the purpose of the liturgical words and actions, the glory of God and the sanctification of the faithful. All right, again, why do we do this? Okay, the glory of God, for him, for him, first and foremost, right? The liturgy, the mass, our prayers are for him, first and foremost, and then the sanctification of the faithful and the transformation of the world, okay? And here's another quote um, from St. Augustine, <coughs> which is so beautiful. Um, and Augustine is just, wow, well, his work is just poetic in itself. Okay, um, and this, I think here he's talking about um, his conversion to the faith, right? So he, uh, well, anyways, to go on about Augustine, he was, as they would say, maybe a bad boy or just, you know, he made some not very good decisions, was like dabbling into Manichaeanism, and uh, he thought the scriptures were just silly. He read them and they're like, oh, this is nothing compared to Cicero or whatever. Um, uh, but then slowly the Lord was bringing about his conversion, praise God, um, and this, so this is part of his journey, right? The music was part of his journey. He said, how I wept, deeply moved by your hymns, songs, and the voices that echoed through your church. What emotion I experienced in them. These sounds flowed into my ears, distilling the truth in my heart. Okay, a feeling of devotion surged within me and tears streamed down my face. Tears that did me good, okay? so. I know I've had those experiences where something in music just touches your heart and you don't even know what it is, <laughs> okay? But you know that it's good and true and beautiful and that God is doing something in you, right? Okay, um, the harmony of, of signs, of song, music, and words and actions is all the more expressive and fruitful when it's expressed in the cultural richness of the people of God who celebrate. Okay, hence religious singing by the faithful is to be intelligently fostered 
Okay, this is again part of the reason why we're doing this tonight is because we want to continue to dive in and study more, learn more, right? Um, the more we know, the better we can love, okay? Um, okay, yes. Religious singing by the faithful is to be int intelligently fostered so that in devotions and sacred ex exercises, as well as in the liturgical services, in conformity with the church's norms, okay, right? So we have to be <laughs> in conformity with what the church is asking of us because ultimately, right, we're entering into that heavenly liturgy and the church has been discerning. We do that, all right? Um, the voices of the faithful may be heard but the texts intended to be sung must always be in conformity with church doctrine. All right, we're gonna talk more about that. Some of the hymns, unfortunately, that came out of the prayer council or out of people really just truly from the bottom of their hearts, you know, composing songs uh, that were moving to them and, and, uh, and seemingly good, but, but now with more wisdom and discernment, we have seen that some of these hymns actually aren't distilling the truth in our heart because if they're for example got some mild heresy or something happening which again i don't think well some of it maybe was intentional because of the prayer council i think other times uh people just thought oh these are nice words this sounds good um but it's not actually the truth okay so we're going to talk about different criteria that can help us pick hymns that are more fitting for the liturgy just because even from the sole fact of they have words that are true, okay? So we definitely want to be speaking the truth and singing the truth. Okay, um, indeed they should be drawn chiefly from sacred scripture and liturgical sources, all right? So again, we can't go wrong with sacred scripture, right? That's really the core. Um, okay, so uh, how are we... Do we need a stretch break? How are we doing? Doing okay? Or do, or do you need one? <laughs> okay, maybe, uh, let's see. Maybe, let's, let's, just take a let's just take five minutes. I'll be back at eight o'clock if you need anything. <laughs> no, okay. If not, this has, been, this has been a lot of information, so if nothing else, we can just be prayerfully in the presence of God and allow him to speak to us, all right? So for those viewing, we'll be back in five minutes.
That's a good idea. Yeah. Who's the one person in the world that knows music and theology that you come up with?
Okay, I think, I think we're ready to begin our second little section here. All right, uh, hopefully people at home maybe got some popcorn or hot chocolate or something. <laughs> I would, okay. All right. Um, something that I want to just talk a little bit about before we um, dive into one particular document here is Something that Pope Benedict XVI said, uh, this was a general audience on September 26, 2012. You can look up the whole text um, where he's talking a little bit about, okay, the words at Mass. And so and one thing that, that some liturgical scholars are saying late, late, lately and, and, and music ministers and uh, pastors and faithful is that we want to sing the Mass and not just sing at Mass, okay? So we're going to be discovering that there are some texts, for example, um, in our Breaking Bread uh, hymnal, or, uh, and during, for the readings, for example, there's always this entrance antiphon, okay? Entrance antiphon, it's like, oh, okay. And now we're starting, we've, uh, in some places, have started to read them or to sing them, and these are actually a text of the Mass. Okay, so we know already that we sing, for example, the Psalms. We sing the Mass parts, Holy, 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 Lamb of God. Um, uh, and when it's a higher solemnity, right, we're doing more and more singing. Um, but so there's this idea of like singing the Mass, so singing, singing the words that's given to us rather than just singing at Mass. Okay, so we know we've already had all this, like, right? Singing is so, so important, okay? Uh, but it's singing the Mass and not just singing at Mass, not just singing anything, right? There are words um, that are given. Uh, and, and Pope Bennett, the big Pope, Pope sorry. I, I get so excited that I just cannot, my lips cannot keep up with me, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, now Emeritus, talks about this a little bit, okay? So he's, um, uh, this is so beautiful, and I didn't highlight something that I'm just looking at right now. So just at the very um, bottom part of that first paragraph, okay, um, he says, along the same lines we read in the Catechism of the Catholic Church that the sacramental celebration, okay, so Holy Mass, is a meeting of God's children with their Father in Christ and the Holy Spirit. This meeting takes the form of a dialogue through actions and words. Okay, so that's just a little bit earlier on. I didn't include that in our catechism um, uh, excerpts. Okay, and even earlier on, well, I should decide this a little bit more. I'm just seeing so much more. It's so beautiful, the whole thing. Okay, the liturgy is a privileged place for the encounter of Christians with God and the one whom he has sent. All right, a sacramental celebration is a meeting of God's children with their father in Christ and the Holy Spirit, this meeting takes the form of a dialogue through actions and words. All right, so this is, again, the heavenly liturgy is meeting the earthly liturgy. Heaven meets earth, right? Jesus comes down, the angels and saints are here, God is made present, and we are united to the body of Christ through the Eucharist. Okay, but a meeting between God's children with their Father, okay, in Christ and the Holy Spirit, and the form that this takes is a dialogue okay, uh, um, speaking in response. And actually, that was one of the things about Vatican II that they wanted to reform was that a lot of that dialogue was happening, if I'm correct about this, I'm pretty sure, that dialogue was happening between the priest and the server. So the server was speaking on behalf of the faithful, which was good and beautiful, but the Council of Fathers saw a, a need to make those responses um, also for the faithful, right? And I think there, there might have been a time where they were, you know, they were making those texts more available to the people. For example, now if you go to a Latin Mass, they provide you with the translation of the things, with the dialogue that's happening, right? And I, maybe you participate more now than, than I, I, by actually, like, saying those words instead of just the server saying them. I'm, I'm not sure about that, actually. So someone maybe correct me in the comments, tell me, uh, the right thing there. Anyways, um, but I know that was one of um, 
the desires and, and what they were discerning from the Holy Spirit was that this dialogue should be happening, you know, with the faithful and the priest and not just between the priest and the server. Okay, so in the bolded section going on, therefore the first requirement for a good liturgical celebration is that there should be prayer and a conversation with God. Okay, so let's see how it doesn't, Pope Benedict is not saying the requirement for a good liturgical celebration is a four-part polyphony, um, you know, harmony on the hymns, organ here, you know, maybe a flute solo there, whatever. No, it's not even, that's, we're not even talking about music right now. Therefore, the first requirement for a good liturgical celebration is that there should be prayer and conversation with God. Wow. So again, if we're not singing or playing or reading or doing anything in that more active regard, if we are just sitting in the pew, which is, again, not just sitting in the pew, this is actively participating, right, in this prayer and conversation with God. First of all, listening. Oh. <laughs> so again, this we're entering into something that's given to us, right? We are entering in, first of all, we are listening to God. Then consequently, right, it's not even saying like, and then your next part is to say a response. But no, listening to God, listening to what he's doing in our hearts. And consequently, there's a response, right? When we listen to God, what can we do but respond with gratitude and thanks, right? This act of participation, which is, um, and, it, and it's given to us, okay? Because how do we respond to this, you know? Um, and this is beautiful. St. Benedict, speaking in his rule of prayer in the Psalms, pointed out to his monks, mens concordat voci, okay? The mind must be in accord with the voice. The mind must be in accord with the voice, okay? The saint teaches that in our prayers, in the prayers of the Psalms, words must precede our thought, okay? And he, he's, go, he's saying, you know, well, he does say, it does not usually happen like this because we have to think, and then what we have thought is converted into words. Okay, so normal life, normal language and communication, we have a thought, okay? Um, or we have to think, okay? Then we have a thought. Then that thought is converted into words, right? I have to think about what I'm gonna say before I say it. Okay, sometimes we speak without thinking, but you know. But really, there has to be actually some cognitive activity happening to be thinking, even if we're not maybe conscious of it, that that, that thought is converted into words. That's language, that's communication, okay? But, okay, he goes on here, instead in the liturgy, the opposite is true. Words come first. God has given us the word, and the sacred liturgy offers us words. All right? Again, this is like, oh, yes, we, this is all, like, okay, for example, it's sometimes, I mean, in this church, you're, you are, there's so much beauty here, and the acoustics are amazing, and whatever, so there is an opportunity to be lifted out of yourself into something greater, and there is in other places, too, but some places are just more conducive to that, and I just, uh, remember so distinctly that in this uh, Dominican church, which my beloved Dominicans in Krakow, who are just so dear to me, in their basilica, which by the way is like from the year 1100 or something like that. I mean, they've been there for 800 years. That math doesn't really totally add up, but sometime in the 1100s, and they've been there for 800 years. Um, and it's so, it's, it's Gothic architecture, which by the way, is my favorite. I mean, Baroque can be beautiful, yes, but I also, I just have to tell you that I really do not like it when it's a Gothic church and they Baroque it. <laughs> they Baroque it, okay, don't fix what's not Baroque, right? Don't, uh, oh my gosh, I, that just drives me nuts. I'm like, why did you put all this Baroque stuff here? Because I love Gothic. Baroque can be beautiful, but only if it's all Baroque. If it's, you know, and anyways, it, sometimes it can just be too much, but Gothic can probably be too much too. Um, but I just remember going there and, and just, I mean, first of all, looking at the, the marble floor and seeing how worn it was and the pews, how worn and, and the candle smoke on the ceiling and everything and just feeling so, I mean, you feel this more like, probably in St. Peter's, for example, where you're just such a tiny little thing, you know, compared, you know, the, you know. Um, but in this church in particular, I just, 
and it's, it was so tall and the windows and, and they're just thinking wow they were like blowing that glass with I don't know what they were doing I don't know how they even built the thing it's just amazing to me um, but just thinking wow there have been almost a thousand years of prayers said in this place and I am just here for you know a hundred years maybe God willing but I'm such I'm just so privileged even to just enter here because it's there have been so many prayers offered here um, and I'm just I'm just a part a very important part okay but a small part in this huge global church which has been you know going on for 2,000 years and has such a rich tradition um, so it's just it, it's one of those humbling things like wow the church has given us so much and this is wisdom based upon 2,000 years of saints and 2,000 years of uh, the church and the Holy Spirit working through the centuries and the prayers and everything so uh, it's just very humbling and, and beautiful to just realize that I'm entering into this and then entering into the heavenly liturgy which is even more just totally infinite and unfathomable really um, so just again entering into this right so yeah praise God I want my mind to conform to all of that right I don't want it to conform to me because I do not have all that wisdom <laughs> okay so that was also just especially um, it was actually in Poland that I started to be exposed to this great wisdom and treasury of the church regarding the liturgy and then realizing wow I really have first of all so much to learn and second of all um, you know again this is just my great privilege to enter into this and not something that I want to like create or make uh, because of my pre my little preferences okay which are important and God can work through those but ultimately we are entering into something that's given okay so that's a lot of a lot here um, but okay so back to that bold paragraph that here instead in the liturgy the opposite is true words come first okay God has given us the word and the sacred liturgy offers us words we must enter into their words into their meaning and receive them within us we must attune ourselves to these words in this way we become children of God we become like God okay we become children of God right so for example um, you know when we make the sign of the cross he's talking about words and actions here that's not just a silly little thing that we do just because we were born and raised Catholic no that's calling upon the power of God and the power of our baptism for example especially with holy water and every time we're like bringing the power of the cross the power of our baptism the power of God our Father every time right so and every time that the priest says you know this is my body given up for you know uh, take and eat those words are actually making possible Jesus coming down to us right so words and actions are so important okay there's a reason why we say amen okay before we receive um, the Holy Eucharist and I think for a time that they would not give you the Jesus in the Eucharist unless they heard amen because if they don't know that you actually believe that this is Jesus in the Eucharist well they can't give it to you know what I mean so this is like what we're saying at Holy Mass what we're doing at Holy Mass um, is affecting what we're saying and doing right words and actions these are things which are um, bringing about the realities okay so our participation verbally and, and being in conformity with these things is making it effective okay it's ultimately God who's doing all this through us um, but yeah why wouldn't we want to attune ourselves to this amazing reality right this amazing thing that's so much bigger than just ourselves right and in this way it's through words and actions that Jesus comes to us in the Holy Eucharist that we are able to receive him be united with him become children of God okay become like God all right um, so he goes on here and there's so much there um, he says for example let us lift up our hearts above the confusion of our apprehensions our desires our narrowness our distractions okay our hearts, our inmost selves, must open in docility to the word of God and be recollected in the church's prayer to receive her guidance to God in the very first or very words we hear and say. The ears of the heart must be tuned, turned to God who is in our midst. Okay, this is the fundamental disposition. Again, not uh, 
you must be a lector this many times a year, okay, you must canter or whatever, you know, like, no, it's actually the fundamental disposition is prayer, right? This conversation with God. Um, Dear friends, we celebrate and live the liturgy well only if we remain in a prayerful attitude and not if we want to do something to make ourselves seen or act, but if we direct our hearts to God and remain in a prayerful attitude, uniting ourselves with the mystery of Christ and his conversation as the Son with the Father. Wow, that's right. We, this is, we are entering into the prayer of Christ. Holy Mass is first and foremost the prayer of the Son to the Father. And we are privileged to unite ourselves with the Son to join in his prayer to the Father. Okay, this is why we don't just do whatever we want during Mass. Not that you are doing that at all, but this is just a good reminder to keep us in check. Okay, this was good for me to keep myself in check because I had a little bit of pride when I was the one picking the music at the little parish and people would say, oh, it was so beautiful today, so lovely. And I was like, mm, yes, this feels good. You know, it, 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 and that's, that's nice. But then, okay, when I got my concussion and I could not sing at mass and I had two black eyes and I was very embarrassed and the whole thing was just like, oh, whatever. Um, I realized, wow, I am putting my, again, I said this last time too, but I'm putting my worth in this good and holy thing, but that's not where my worth comes from. My worth comes from being a beloved daughter of God, right? So my first responsibility and obligation is, I mean, of course, he wants me to use my gifts and talents, but it's, again, this active participation, which is uniting myself to Christ in his prayer to the Father, okay? That's why we do what the church is asking of us, because it's the Holy Spirit who's guiding the church in these... uh, in these guidelines and these words that are given to us, okay, first and foremost from Holy Scripture, all right? Okay, and this is so beautiful. After that, he goes on to say, God himself teaches us to pray, okay? He gives, he himself gave us the appropriate words with which to address him, words that we find in the Psalter, in the great orations of the sacred liturgy and the Eucharistic celebration. Okay, and there's really so much more here and we can read the whole thing, but I better, move on because we have also lots to cover all right but just i invite you to just take this to prayer okay read it in the presence of our blessed lord in the eucharist um in the presence of the tabernacle because uh how can this not move in our hearts right this is the conversation between um god's children and with their father right amazing so again we want to conform our mind and hearts with these words that God is giving us, conforming ourselves to Christ in his prayer to the Father, okay? After all of that, okay, our brains get a little bit of a break because, or maybe not a break, but this is going in a different direction, okay? The next section that I have on the next page is terms of liturgical books, okay? Now, I am learning right alongside with you. Okay, I've learned so much putting together these lectures. I was really blessed, again, to be able to take a whole master's class on the liturgy alone, which I was like, why is this an elective? It should actually be core requirement because the liturgy is the most important thing we do and we need to understand what is happening during mass. So um, I'm excited that more resources are being put out there that more people are talking about this and learning more because really we just need to know what the church is asking of us and what happens at Holy Mass, okay? So I actually had to look up these terms because I did not know actually exactly what they meant. So I'm learning along with you um, and we are on this journey together, okay? So first and, uh, or maybe not first and foremost, but the first on my list here is the lectionary, all right? That's probably what most of us are familiar with. This is the official liturgical book which has the readings and responsorial psalms assigned for each Mass of the year, all right? So that's what we read from at Holy Mass. That's where we find the psalms um, and the readings, okay? Now, that lectionary, if I'm not mistaken, Father, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been a while since I've been a lector, so I haven't looked at that for a while. But if I'm not mistaken, Father, the entrance, all the antiphons, they're in the lectionary, right? Or are they, in the Ro- are they only in the Roman Missal? Okay, okay, so Father, just he's telling me that he's not sure about the lectionary because he has a missile, but they are for sure in the missile. 
Yeah, okay. So again, I'm learning right alongside with you. All right, but we do, okay, the lectionary for sure we know has the readings and the responsorial psalm um, for each mass of the year, all right? Then we have the Roman, Roman Missal, also um, the Missale Romanum, okay, in Latin. Uh, so again, these church documents are, that Latin is still the language of the church, okay, so these documents are, first of all, uh, in Latin, these books and these texts, and then, so once everybody agrees on the Latin version, then, then it's the responsibility of all the other language groups to translate those into the different language groups. Okay, so that's like the text. And then we have the Roman Missal, which is the English translation of the Missale Romanum. And this is the book containing the prescribed prayers. Okay, and I put in parentheses, the texts of these chants. Okay, so the antiphons, entrance, offertory, communion, and instructions for the celebration of mass in the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so this current edition that we have is from 2002, and then those texts translated into English were released in 2011. So we all, probably all remember when we had some changes in the creed, um, and I think even some of the mass parts, for example, Lamb of God, there were some um, adjustments that were made there. Um, but that was released in 2011. So again, we can see even by that the year there, in like 2002 and 2011, right, the council was back in the 60s, right? So these, it's taken a while, right? Again, so this is, again, a little bit of that chaos, which happens after a council. We're trying to implement these things. So even the texts, um, or they were under revisions in any case, um, and this final version was in 2011. So this was a continual process and is now um, available for use. Okay, so the Roman gradual, or in Latin is graduale romanum, is an official liturgical book containing the melodies for the chants used at mass. Okay, so these, th these antiphons that are prescribed for the mass, uh, this is the book where you can find the melodies. All right, so, uh, but these are, these musical settings are like for the Latin, okay? But then there also now has been, after these things were translated into English, now there are melodies being composed for these, for the English translations, okay? In my personal opinion, some of them are better than others. Um, I do, well, Father Larry Weber, his, his book is, is good um, and beautiful. I think he's done a really great job. Also, Adam Bartlett has done a great job. Um, in his Lumen Christi Missal. We've used, we've sprinkled a few of those in every once in a while here. Um, but again, these resources were not available until just recently. Okay, um, Adam Bartlett is still working on composing and completing. Um, he's also actually composing melodies for um, hymns for the Liturgy of the Hours, the new breviary that's going to be coming out that, again, that our priests and sisters and nuns will be using, and monks. Um, so he's been quite busy with lots of things, okay? Um, but again, there, these resources, so again, there's not any need to feel ashamed or um, guilty or anything like that, because we simply just have not had the resources to be able to sing these texts that the church is asking us to sing. It's just taken time. And now we have them, so step by step, uh, we can start, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, okay, so Father is saying, do I need to tell you what an antiphon is? That's a great idea. We should talk about that, all right? Um, so maybe a good illustration could be, okay, so go to uh, the last pages of this packet, okay? Thank you, Father. It's good that <laughs> to have a little clarification. Okay, because I also, Okay, I had no idea until I took this liturgy class. I was like, antiphons? What's an antiphon? I, I also was in this place, so thank you very much for bringing that up. Okay, I also had no idea. Um, so it's in, maybe important to kind of put into context here that, okay, we've got Holy Mass with its texts and things, the prayers and the readings that we pray. The Liturgy of the Hours, or the Divine Office, again, is what Father and um, um, 
nuns and sisters and, and monks and brothers pray as part of their obligation, right? It's called the opus dei, which means work of God, the divine office, right? So this is, and actually for contemplative monks and nuns, this is like when I was with the sisters in uh, the Poor Clares, this is their main work, right? This is their responsibility in the church is to pray um, all 150 psalms in a certain cycle. Either they pray them all in one week or they pray them all um, in a month, depending on if they're more active and have a teaching apostolate, for example, or our diocesan priests, or they're totally contemplative and they, that's their main work. And let me tell you, it does take eight hours. We did the math and it was like, okay, that is, it's eight hours a day. So it's like, it's like a full-time work day and you don't even get Sundays off, okay? So this is like, this is their work and the church values prayer so much and values the liturgy so much that, and, and God values this, that he calls people to devote their life to that alone, okay, which is amazing, all right? So this is just gonna give you a little bit of a taste of what that, those Liturgy of the Hours is about, which is an extension of Holy Mass, all right? So the purpose of the Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office, is to sanctify the entire day. So it's, yeah, we were in the monastery, it's like, oh, we were doing some work or something, whatever, and then the bells would ring and we, oh, it's time for the next hour, and then we go. Then we go back, maybe eat, and then the bells ring in, oh, then we go back to prayer. It's like always you're being called back to prayer, right? The voice of the bridegroom, we call it, the bells was the voice of the bridegroom. And it's so funny because you'd think that you would just say, oh, praise God, I, I don't want to do any more of this work. I, yeah, I would love to go to prayer right now and just be in the presence of God and sing for him and whatever. But it is amazing how... <laughs> We get addicted to work and we're just like, oh no, the bell, are we running out of time? Oh no, we can oh no, prayer, we gotta go. It's like, how could you not wanna go? I mean, it's just, it's just so funny how, we're, that's just human, human nature. For some reason, we are attached to work and work is good and beautiful, but it has to be in balance. Okay, um, so, uh, but it's an extension of Holy Mass. It's like extending the Mass throughout the whole day. And again, lay people are not called to pray all these hours. That would just be impossible. We can't do that. We have other responsibilities um, appropriate to our vocation and, and necessary in our vocation in the world. Um, but it is something beautiful and it's something that lay people, for example, do you know the, magne the little magazine, the Magnificat, or Give Us This Day? There are little um, publications that are a shorter version or shorter Christian prayers. Another one, Vatican II also wanted to bring this, the Liturgy of the Hours, to be more accessible to the lay faithful. Okay, so there are like shortened versions because again, we can't pray all of these. And, um, but you could, for example, pray morning prayer or maybe evening prayer or whatever um, as part of your prayer whatever you're drawn to, okay? But this is an example, and Father, maybe, maybe this matches what you prayed today, uh, for, or what you will pray today for Vespers. Maybe it doesn't. It depends on what feast day it is, or uh, what different orders celebrate. But anyways, this is an example, okay? So we see that it starts, always starts with, God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Okay? Um, then there's always a hymn, okay? And actually, some of the most ancient hymns that we have in the church originally came from the Liturgy of the Hours, okay? They were actually, they, that's a core part of the Liturgy of the Hours is this hymn, okay? And I, um, I know this hymn from the monastery, which I think we did a different melody or something like that, but that's kind of fun, okay? Now, we go into the psalmody, all right? So we see that there's an antiphon here, Okay, an antiphon is like, is a short, a little snippet of scripture, just something very short. If I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Okay, so that, and that's right from Psalm 137, which is what is prayed next. So what happens is that, um, well, depending on the community, but in, in my community, for example, one sister who was the versicler who started intoned the chanting, uh, she would stand and, and chant, if I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. So that is kind of like the snippet of scripture that we're going to focus on while we're praying the psalm, okay? And then, and then they pray the psalm together, back and forth, uh, between two sides of the choir, um, uh, that the psalm is prayed, and then the antiphon is repeated again at the end, all right? And then, then there's a moment of silence, 
or, or more than just a moment, but a time of silence to really let the Holy Spirit uh, show you what it is that he wants you to take away from the psalm. And it's amazing because, I mean, I was just there two and a half years. But the sisters, for example, who are celebrating the Golden Jubilee, they've been in the monastery for 50 years, okay? And they say, you know what? Every single time I pray the psalms, it's always fresh, always new, okay? Because this is the word of God. This is scripture. And the Holy Spirit is always going to show us something different that our heart needs to know right now, okay? Then, turning the page, we have the second antiphon, okay? In the presence of the angels, I will sing to you, my God. And there's another psalm. And again, in the presence of the angels, I will sing to you, my God. These antiphons look a lot like our responsorial psalm at Holy Mass, okay? So that's something that we're already singing that is a text in the Mass that's given to us. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of an antidote that so, and when I grew up, you, most of you know where I'm from, but we did go around to many different churches because we, Dawson has been paired with uh, several over the years, so I won't tell you which parish it was. Uh, but we, at the psalm, for a particular time, we always sang, shepherd me, O God, you know that, shepherd me, O God, beyond my moon, whatever, uh, which is beautiful and haunting and somehow, I mean, it, it really is lovely. Okay, and I always looked forward to that. And I didn't really realize until actually I went to college and was actually paying attention more to the music that, oh, wait, the psalm changes every single time? There's a different psalm every Sunday? Oopsie. Okay, and again, the parishioners at this parish had no bad intentions or anything. Maybe it was just the fact that they only had time to practice that one and that's all they knew and that's what they did. But also, I, so first of all, um, we were singing what was actually a paraphrase of the psalm. So the, the real psalm is, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and gives me repose. Okay, so, not, so we were singing a paraphrase. I mean, it was beautiful and maybe even appropriate for Mass, but it was not actually the psalm itself that's, you know, that's in Holy Scripture, and, I mean, and given in the lectionary, okay? So we were kind of robbing ourselves from the actual scripture which is meant to be sung at Holy Mass, okay, which you are doing faithfully, and I think most every parish is. I just, I don't know what was going on there, but that was just one of these maybe misunderstandings, okay? Secondly, though, um, the response to Royal Psalm is, has been prayerfully picked to go with the other readings. You know, there's a reason why each psalm is particular to each Sunday. So not only were we robbing ourselves from the actual scripture itself that's supposed to be sung, we are also robbing ourselves from this rich, the richness of singing all the other psalms, right? That are, you know, they're supposed to be different psalms on different Sundays. So um, this is part of the reason why, wow, yes, we want to conform ourselves to the word that's given to us because it's so rich and there's so much there and miss out, right? So just imagine if we read the same exact readings every single Sunday at Mass. Well, and then, and then if we paraphrase them also, well, then you're not, first of all, you're not even getting scripture. Second of all, you're not getting the depth and the variety and the whole story, right? So the Psalms tell a story. Um, the readings tell a story of Jesus' life, of all the things that led up to him and what came after. So again, conforming ourselves to the word because there's so much there, right? So when we make, and again, I'm not, you're not doing this at all, but when in the past people have chosen to do some of these more improvisational things uh, based upon their own desires or what they think is appropriate or whatever, instead of following what the church is asking, we're robbing ourselves of so much, right? Of so much. So, for example, um, so, this is kind of like the structure of the antiphons for the Mass as well, okay? So when we say, for example, the entrance antiphon, it's a short bit of scripture, then interspersed in between, just like the responsorial psalm, there's a verse from the psalms, okay? Then back to the antiphon, then the psalm verse, then the antiphon, then the psalms. Okay, so for example, um, we could even go to today's entrance antiphon. Um, so today's entrance antiphon is from Psalm 17. 
To you I call, for you will surely heed me, O God. Turn your ear to me, hear my words. Guard me as the apple of your eye. In the shadow of your wings, protect me. Okay, beautiful, right? Guard me as the apple of your eye. In the shadow of your wings, protect me. Um, so there is an entrance antiphon. Uh, and if you want, maybe, maybe if you want to look at page 828 of, your, of Breaking Bread, then you can follow along with me and just kind of see um, the structure of this. Okay, um, that yes, there's an entrance antiphon, and then we see the responsorial psalm, remember your mercies, O Lord, and they don't have the offertory here, um, but it is given in the Roman Missal. Um, and then the communion, Lord, who may abide in your tent and dwell on your holy mountain, whoever walks without fault and does what is just. Okay, and they don't give the text here of the actual, like, verses that go in between these, because usually that's done by a cantor, right? So we're kind of, um, if everybody was chanting the verses together, it would get a little bit, uh, even like two or four people together, you really have to practice. So that's why <clears throat> we usually have a cantor do that. Um, but that's just to show you that, okay, wow, there are actual, there are more texts that the church has given us for Holy Mass, okay? And, and we're going to get into, um, so how exactly did these get left out, right? Okay, so again, because it took time to translate them, um, there, were, there just weren't resources and there weren't even melodies for these. So some parishes have been reading them, and that's fine, but in time as these resources become available, right, we're expected then, um, you know, to do our best to start in introducing these things, okay? To do what the church is asking. Um, and what's beautiful is that, for example, like a communion antiphon, which is probably the most natural thing that most parishes are taking this first step is um, that we still have all the four hymns that we normally have, you know, we have the entrance hymn, we have the offertory hymn, communion hymn, and closing hymn. Um, but the most natural place to start inserting some of these things is probably, well, first of all, you could even do the entrance antiphon before that first hymn or after. Uh, and then at Holy Communion, singing the entrance and, or singing the communion antiphon before the communion hymn. Okay, and that's a pretty natural thing because most often everyone's kind of shuffling to the aisle and not really able to sing from their hymnals anyway. And the, the short responsory, just like a responsorial psalm that we do sing at Holy Mass, it's, it's beautiful because it's something short and simple that you can join in on as you're in communion line. You don't have to bring your book with you. You can join in on that response. And actually, what I think part of the design here is that it's a short piece of scripture that's meant to stay, to stay with us during the week. And if we're singing these repeatedly, it's just like responsorial psalms. I mean, do you have sometimes, like, especially Della, when we do the funeral, like, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Like, sometimes this is designed that that stays with us, right? And we carry it with us through our week, through our lives. Um, uh, and I, I just remember when I started learning some of these uh, antiphons, there was one, for example, it was something like, um, if I can, I might butcher it, but remain in me as I remain in you, says the Lord. And I just remember, like, because I was singing it for the Mass, and, you know, and then that whole week, remain in me as I remain in you, says the Lord. Wow, like, that's something so beautiful that was just, and with my prayer, when I was walking to school, whatever, and that's what this is designed to do, right? This repetition that this can, like, become a part of us, right? We want scripture to just be a part of our core being, okay? So that's kind of what um, an antiphon looks like. It really looks like a responsorial psalm, okay? But, so you could think about it this way, that there are, like, actually responsorial psalm-like things, these antiphons, which are asked for at the entrance, um, offertory, and Holy Communion. And these are texts, again, so when we say, like, singing, uh, verse, okay, just singing at Mass, or singing the Mass, okay, singing the texts which are given to us 
in the Mass, and these antiphons are part of what's given to us. Okay? Um, so there, <laughs> yikes, I am just, uh, there's always so much to say. So, um, uh, maybe what I'm going to do is just hone in, and there's really so much here. So, if we turn to, and again, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry about these page numbers, but after the, the Benedict the 16th audience uh, on 23A, so we are looking at the terms of the liturgical books, Okay, <laughs> and we'll just quickly, quickly go through this and quickly, uh, wow, oh no, <laughs> I didn't get very far enough, oh well. Okay, so uh, I have bolded certain sections from this general instruction of the Roman Missal. Okay, so again, the Roman Missal is the book which contains the prayers, the text of the chants, and literally the instructions for the celebration of the Mass. So even just down to the very nitty gritty of what the priest needs to do, what the faithful need to do, the servers, everything. Okay? Um, all right, so then we have the Roman gradual, which has the text and the melodies for these antiphons, and then the simple gradual, which has text and simpler melodies. Okay, because sometimes we can't, in monasteries, when they've got time to practice and they do this every day, all day, yeah they can do the most advanced, and that's awesome. And some parishes, if they have, can pay professional choirs to practice you know, how many times a week, awesome. By all means, yes, they should try to do you know, these advanced things. Um, for those of us who don't have those resources, the simpler ones, that's great, right? If we can do simple and beautiful, that's way better than trying to do advanced and not doing it well, right? Um, so we've got uh, different resources here. Um, uh, so this is all good, okay? Then there's this general instruction of the Roman Missal, which kind of even breaks down further what is to be done at Mass. And um, so I have taken excerpts of this, because it's a long document, all right? So, but excerpts that are most important to us, and I have bolded sections there. Um, and I hope that we have a chance to come back and really dive into all of this, but I do want to just highlight some important sections. How does that sound, Father? Okay, awesome. Um, yes. Okay, so without even, I don't, I don't want you to have to follow all this, but it does, okay, so it is not always necessary to sing all of the texts that are themselves meant to be sung, right? So at a daily mass, we're not going to sing all these texts, right? Because that's just not practical. But on Sundays, by all means, and on bigger feasts like Christmas and Easter, yes, we should pull at all the stops. Okay, again, even if they're simple melodies, fine. But if we can sing them, great. All right. Um, and there are certain texts that are more of greater importance. Okay, and, and I do have um, a document which shows that. Okay, uh, we're not going to dive into that right now. And again, it even says sacred silence is also part of the celebration observed at designated times. Okay, um, and the silence is an invitation to pray. For example, after the penitential act, individuals recollect themselves, whereas after reading or the homily, all meditate briefly on what they have heard. After communion, they praise God in their hearts and pray to him. Okay, so they even talk about silence here. Um, then it goes on about the individual parts of the mass. And here, okay, um, under the entrance, which is on, which is my horrible numbering system, but it's page 18AB. Are you there? <laughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. I really messed it up with the computer program, whatever. Okay, so at that first, and I put it in these two columns because sometimes it gets, it's easier to read if everything, you know, like a newspaper, if everything is closer together. So that's why I did that. So under the entrance, okay, so this is like just an example here. Uh, after the people have gathered, the entrance chant begins as the priest enters with the deacon and ministers. Okay, this is beautiful. The purpose of this chant, again, so what they mean by that is the entrance antiphon. Okay, that's what they mean. The purpose of this chant, this antiphon, is to open the celebration, foster the unity of those who have gathered, introduce their thoughts to the mystery of the liturgical season or festivity, okay, because the antiphon is specific to that mass, all right, just like the psalm is specific to that mass. So, for example, 
we, we call, um, we have Laetare Sunday in Lent. Why do we call it Laetare Sunday? Because Laetare is the first word of that entrance antiphon for that Mass. Okay, Laetare, I don't know actually what it is, but it's like, rejoice, O daughter of Jerusalem. Okay, thank you, Father. <laughs> He's nodding to me and helping me out. Okay, um, or Gaudete Sunday is also, that's the first word of the first word of the Mass to be sung, which is the entrance antiphon. So these, and these are texts which have been, like Laetare Sunday, Gaudete Sunday, those antiphons have been the same since, you know, like, uh, it's, it has been like a thousand years and more that we've had the same text, okay, that we are singing at the beginning of Mass. So, and some of those chant melodies, especially, okay, so at the monastery, for example, we use the Liber Universalis, which is like the Latin chant of probably, I mean, the most advanced form. And some of these are coming from, or some of the Mass parts, some of them like the fifth, sixth, seventh, or no, like eighth centuries, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, some of the hymns, ancient hymns are older, but anyways, some of these chant melodies have been sung for literally over a thousand years. So that is amazing, okay? Um, now, so this is where it gets uh, to, for example, why did hymns uh, come in here, okay? Um, so in Diocese of the United States, I'm on number one here, um, under the entrance and the capture a couple paragraphs, in the Diocese of the United States of America, there are four options for the entrance chant, okay? Number one, the antiphon from the Roman Missal. So again, that book where the texts for the Mass, so the entrance antiphon that's given here in our Breaking Bread, um, that's where the texts come from, okay? Or the psalm from the Roman Gradual as set to music there or in another musical setting. So. And this, uh, there's a reason why this is like one, two, three, four, because that's our first option. That's our ideal, okay? Um, so if we have the resources, if we have the capability, the abilities, that's the one we want to choose, okay? Because again, this is singing the Mass, the Mass, the texts that are given to us, okay? Um, the next option is a, the seasonal antiphon and psalm of the simple gradual, okay? So we can also choose a more simple, musical setting. Also, even it says, you know, the same text of the Centrist Antiphon set to another musical setting. So that's, again, where Father Weber comes in with his hymnal, or Adam Bartlett uh, with his music that I personally like so much, and that we now have access to in our parish, okay? Um, or a song or from another collection of psalms and antiphons approved by the Conference of Bishops or the Diocesan Bishop, including psalms arranged in responsorial or metrical forms, okay? Um, and I... To be honest, I'm not exactly sure, I, I don't know if I know an example of, from that category, um, but maybe in the comments I will be able to tell you something later. Um, or number four, which has become the norm, okay, and again, there's no blaming here, this is not a guilty thing, a suitable liturgical song similarly approved by the Conference of Bishops or the Diocesan Bishops, okay? Now, again, there, we had the texts for the Roman Missal, but we didn't have, first of all, them translated into English right after the council, and we didn't have, and so, of course, if we didn't have the text in English, we couldn't compose melodies for texts that are not there yet, okay? Now we have those resources, but so, and then, you know, these other things were not as accessible, or people didn't know about it. Again, if people were um, being led by the parish council, they weren't being encouraged to read these documents, so they, didn't, they weren't really aware. I never heard about these antiphons until graduate school. Okay, so that's not good. <laughs> or not, not good, but just, yeah, go ahead. Right, so Father's saying he never heard about these in the seminary. Okay, so this is no, this is, okay, so there were some people who probably knew about it who were neglecting their duties to pass on the teachings of the church and what the church is asking. We, yeah, there was some neglect happening here. All right, I think most often it was just, people didn't, people had no idea, they didn't know. Okay, they might have, like Father and I were talking that he said that he saw the text, you know, in the Missal and was thinking, well, what's that for? Why is it here if we don't say it, right? So this has just been a lack of formation, a lack of information, right? And so this is why, okay, now, this is our chance, right? Now. 
we know, we have some resources now. So step by step, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna dive in, okay? So this number four, this hymn, um, has become the norm, okay? So most often in most parishes, we see the entrance, okay, which they've chosen an appropriate, you know, well, more or less appropriate. I think now things are getting better and hymns are getting more appropriate. Um, or, okay, they always, there have always been appropriate hymns, I think. However, again, sometimes influenced by the parrot council, other times just out of the goodness of people's hearts who are not catechized, hymns come that are, yeah, mildly her heretical, or maybe very largely heretical, or just um, not as appropriate. So I think we are very blessed in these parishes that we are, you know, have a uh, good sense of things, but we can always learn more and be more informed, okay, about how to choose hymns. Um, so this has become a norm, and, and my question for all of this was, wait, when did hymns become a part of Mass anyway? You know, if we have all these texts, um, and, and I still, I'm, I'm so very sorry because I was going to investigate this more, and I don't have the best answer in the world, but I know for sure that in, there's one document um, called, it's not Musicum Sacrum, which is something that we have been looking at, but it's called Musicae Sacrae, which is not a council document. Um, I, actually, you know what, I'm not even sure if it's in the cyclical or whatever, but it's a letter from Pope Pius XII, if I'm not mistaken, and it kind of gives the history, I just learned about this, okay, so I'm so sorry I didn't have it prepared for you. Um, it kind of gives the history of, of hymns, okay, where did hymns come from? Um, and unfortunately, I didn't read it close enough to give you a report. But, um, but even during, in the extraordinary form, so maybe even some of you remember, and of course, there, there were hymnals, right? There was the St. Gregory hymnal. This was all pre-Vatican II. There were hymns in the vernacular, and there were hymn books. So these hymns were being sung in the extraordinary form and still can be sung in the extraordinary form in the appropriate places, okay? Which... Um, is in the natural pauses of the liturgy, which, for example, um, could be before you know, um, before mass, before the entrance antiphon. We have a hymn, beautiful. Okay, after mass is over, or like after the blessing, as Father's processing out with the servers, we have a hymn. Great. Okay, there also are natural pauses at the offertory. We can have a hymn there. There, it's a natural pause at communion. We can have a hymn there. All right. Um, However, uh, these texts of the Mass, which are given to us, again, conforming our minds and our hearts to the word given to us, our first choice is these, are these antiphons, okay? Now, uh, we, uh, I've got to wrap this up here, but I just, I want to draw your attention. I'm hoping that I will be able to come back with you and dive a little bit more into some of these things because I have a lot more to say. Um, but I do just want to... Uh, well, maybe, maybe next time we can dive into this more because maybe you're thinking like, wow, this seems really overwhelming. There are all these like texts that we aren't singing and uh, actually, well, we can, we can quickly look at it. So if you turn uh, to about six pages from the end, it's called 25.5a, smiley face, because that's the craziest page number and I'm so sorry about that. But uh, it's, it's right after two big pictures, two big pictures. Father's laughing at me. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. It just this. It's not my. It's not my skill set. So anyway, I'll do the best I can. All right. Uh, so I, I really hope that next time I can dive in with you in these different realms of music. Um, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna say it very quickly. Okay. And I hope that I can extend this more with you. Okay. So first. Uh, <laughs> I'm going all out of order. I will, we'll just go this through this quickly. Okay, the big pictures, right? So first we have the first realm of music, which is culture at large, okay? So the church, God, okay, wants musicians to be excellent in their musicianship in the world, right? We want faithful Catholics playing Rachmaninoff and playing Bach and Mozart, okay? We want faithful Catholic musicians in the world at large, okay? The next is evangelization. We want and we need musicians to be creating music that speaks the language of the time, 
Okay, so a great example of this, Father and I have laughed about this, is, and it's amazing and beautiful, is, for example, okay, there's this amazing order of friars called the CFRs, and their, their mother house is in the Bronx. Okay, so they're working in the projects with inner city kids, right? And one of their brothers is writing hip hop music and is Catholic and the theology is amazing. I mean, I listen to this stuff, well, actually when I'm like driving home late at night when I come home from stuff and it keeps me awake and it's fun and it's, the theology is so good. Okay, this is music that is teaching the church, the um, scripture and the faith and it's amazing and beautiful and speaks the language of young people of our time, right? Not all young people are into that music, but a lot of them are, and especially these kids in the inner city, right? Amazing, okay, we need that. However, we know that we're not gonna use the hip hop at mass, okay? As much as I love it in the car, love it on a run, we're not gonna use it at mass, okay? Next realm is discipleship and devotion, okay? And I, would, I, I wanna break these down more to you, so this is just scratching the surface, but this is like the hymns that we, know and love so much, okay? How great thou art, be thou my vision. These, these hymns that are, and, even, and more contemporary, Matt Marr or whatever, they're coming from our personal prayer and they're teaching our personal prayer and they're coming from our heart, right? And they're teaching us how to be disciples, helping us grow closer to God. Amazing, yes, there is a place for these at Holy Mass in these natural pauses we just talked about. We need that, praise God, okay? But the top of the mountain, of this music mountain, is the liturgy, okay? And so this is like the text, for example, of the entrance antiphon, the texts that the church gives us for the mass to sing. Like this is, this is the entrance antiphon for today. This is the responsorial psalm for today. These are, for, for example, the prayers of consecration. Um, these are the responses between priests and the faithful. Um, these are the texts that the church gives us to sing. Again, singing the mass, all right? And this, uh, and we're going to talk about this more, this is, um, this is specifically countercultural, this, this style, or this, the music that's fitting for this, and because it's something totally outside of the culture, right? This is the heavenly culture. This is the words of heaven, okay? And, and this music is uh, at the service of the word completely, okay? So, I mean, for, so chant, English chant, what, Spanish chant, whatever, Latin chant, it is at the service of the word. So scripture is in prose, right? I mean, the Psalms, okay, yeah, they could be kind of poetry-ish, but when you sing scripture, it is, it's prose, so we can't just use a metrical hymn, right? Like, be thou my vision, or we'd have to paraphrase the words, and this is what hymns do, right? Shepherd Neil, God is paraphrasing um, uh, the psalm to fit the meter, or um, uh, all creatures of our God and King, or whatever. You know, it's paraphrasing scripture, which is good and beautiful, um, putting it to a meter, but it's, it's subservient to the meter of the song, okay? The music has to be, or the words have to be changed a little bit to fit the music. In chant, we want to be singing the exact words given to us, right? The responsorial psalm. We don't mess around with the words. It's exactly verbatim, word for word, the psalm and the scripture. Okay, we don't paraphrase, right? We don't sing shepherd me, O God, because that's a paraphrase. We can sing that at a different time, but not for the responsorial psalm, not for the antiphons, okay? Um, and... Uh, yeah, so it's completely, it, this is a kind of music that's completely at the service of the word, right? Because we, don't, we want to sing exactly the scriptural text that's given to us, okay? So that's just an introduction to that. Um, and then just very quickly, so on the next page, 25.5a, smiley face, is <laughs> um, just some of these things, and again, like this is the ideal, and I was looking at this, Father and I were like, oh my gosh, this is just like crazy because, okay, so what is basically saying in these um, excerpts is that, okay, we know that not everything can be sung at every single mass, but there are different degrees, like things that should be sung. If, if nothing else can be sung, these should be sung, or if we're gonna do some singing, we should prioritize these. Okay, so in the first degree, the entrance rites, the greeting of the priest and the reply of the people. Okay, oops, I don't know if we sing that every time. Okay, the liturgy of the word, the acclamations of the gospel, which, fun fact, is actually not the gospel acclamation, like the Alleluia, we actually sing every time. 
but this is like, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Oops, <laughs> that's part of the first degree. Oh no, okay, then the Eucharistic liturgy, and yes, these are sung, um, especially in, uh, uh, excuse me, um, solemnities and things, okay, the formals of the dismissal. Then, this blows my mind, following, or the following belong to the second degree. Okay, the Kyrie, the Gloria, on you stay. What? Even those, you know, those are things that you'd think like, yeah, we'd sing the Gloria even before, you know, the entrance rise or whatever. Okay, and then the next one, the creed. The creed? Okay, and I will be honest with you, I've done a lot of liturgical work and I've been so blessed. And at the monastery, we did sing the creed <clears throat> at solemnities, okay? But even in the parishes, they're trying to implement these uh, reforms and have been, for example, like really working at this for a decade. Okay, we only sang the creed just like once or twice, like on really high. So, you know, and then here, the prayer of the faithful. I don't think I've ever heard anyone sing the prayer of the faithful. You know, so this is, you know, so as this goes on and on, you know, like what? Um, so my point here is, okay, we've got this ideal. Okay, the church is asking us this. Um, but just to know, like, with all reverence and gratitude, like, just, we're, we're taking this step by step, right? The resources haven't been there. Now we've got them, okay, for, for a lot of these things. Um, and just knowing that, okay, this is what the church had asked, and because of the pair council and some other misunderstandings then, and things and the chaos that's happened after the council, these weren't implemented like we would like to have seen them, okay? It's, no, it's not really, we're not pointing fingers, we're not blaming, again, not feeling guilty, but just knowing, okay, this is an ideal. It's probably gonna take a while to get there, but we're gonna start, okay? We're gonna start. Um, uh, and a great place to start is by looking at what we already do. Okay, so turn a couple pages to 27A. Okay, I know I'm holding you a little bit longer. If anyone needs to leave, just leave. I, I won't feel bad, okay? And, and same with you online. If you need to shut it off right now and finish later, no problem. I know people have kids to put to bed. All right, and other responsibilities. Okay, um, a great place to start is by educating ourselves on what we already use, which is hymns, right? Okay, so we can, we can uh, be... Uh, better discerners of fitting hymns for the Mass. Okay, and this is a great resource. I have, okay, there is an official document and I have more copies of this outside and I was, during the break, we were talking a little bit with those who are here um, about hymns in the church and what's appropriate and what is maybe not as appropriate or actually not appropriate because uh, because of the parent council, again, and because of just lack of formation with some composers and lyricists, there have been problems um, with some hymns. Uh, and so this, this document here, which is, okay, and I attached this also in the email for those who um, are joining us online, is called Catholic Hymnody at the Service of the Church, an aid for evaluating hymn lyrics. Okay, so this is nothing about musical style or anything like that, it's really just, okay, are the lyrics of these songs appropriate for Mass, okay? And a simplified, simplified resource here is um, this little one-page resource for choosing hymns at Mass, okay? So if you wanna dive deep and get the whole thing, this is a great document, but if you just want a quick uh, way to remember things, a quick resource when you're choosing hymns, this uh, is a great place to start, this resource is for choosing hymns for Mass. And this came out of our own diocese, uh, Office of Worship, all right, uh, in 2021, so it's very recent, okay? So, uh, so this does address both hymn text and the sound of the music, all right? So hymn text, this should be true, right? So we are reading that this music should distill in us the truths of our faith, okay? So it should be true. The text need to clearly communicate authentic church teaching words should not be confusing or misleading, all right? So if there's some stuff in there, I remember I've sung, I sang one song at a funeral once, and I, I noticed too late, you know, that it was, that it actually was heretical, and the best thing I could think of doing was just changing a few words, <laughs> okay? I don't know if that was the best thing to do. 
I, I don't know, maybe Father and I could talk about that, or you, you can help me, but I, I just, I was like, wow, I don't think I can, like, sing this in good conscience. I just, I have to change a couple of the words, okay? And I don't think anyone noticed, probably. All right, but we should really if, avoid hymns that are confusing or misleading, okay? And again, a lot of us haven't, I, I wasn't catechized, right, until I went to grad school, so I wasn't properly formed even to be able to discern if something was heretical or not. I just didn't know. And still, I, you know, need to do more research and, and, um, and really continue to learn about my faith so that I can be even, a, you know, a quicker discerner of these things, okay? This is a great, this is a great criteria, God-centered, okay? Him should be focused on God to avoid overemphasis on ourselves, so remember, we are conforming our minds and hearts to the words given to us by God, okay? We're conforming our minds and hearts to the heavenly liturgy, which is happening that we are just so <clears throat> privileged to participate in, okay? So a quick way to do this, a helpful, it can be helpful to avoid the use of hymns that use the words I, us, or we. Okay, that's a nice practical tip, all right? Um, uh... How are you doing, Father? <laughs> okay, okay. I, I know it's, anybody can get up at any time and stretch or do what you need to do. What's that? Oh, I know. <laughs> I know, I'll just start to do it. Anyways, okay. I know I'm getting kind of silly now, so I better behave myself. All right. The title of the hymn can say a lot about the content. Okay, I love this too, right? Titles like Praise to the Lord or Rejoice the Lord is King are good in indicators that the hymn is centered on God, right? So if we already have, you know, some, like this can be very telling. If that's, if we're already saying praise the Lord or rejoice the Lord is king, right, then we can be pretty sure that the rest of the hymn, right, or if it's like, but other, if it's things about like us or we, that can maybe point us in the direction that maybe this isn't really God-centered and more centered on us, okay? Scriptural liturgical, okay? Again, we read that in the document. Scriptural texts and liturgical texts are always preferred. So what does that mean by liturgical texts? That's, again, like the entrance antiphon that's given to us at Mass, the Psalms, okay? Um, but if it comes from Scripture, that is, and the Catechism said that, right? That's our primary source, right? Mary, when she sings her canticle, what kind of text is it? Oh, uh, I, uh, I don't know, sing a new church into being. Okay, no, it's not that. It is, uh, my soul magnifies in the Lord. Like, the Lord has done great things for me, and holy is his name. You know, it's coming from scripture. So we can look to Our Lady, right? She's an example. Um, she, her hymn was all scripture, right? And yet, it was coming from the depths of her heart, because she was so, they it's say, like, the church fathers and the ancients were fluent in the language of scripture, wouldn't that be amazing if we were fluent in the language of Scripture? And, and first of all, then be able to recognize if something was Scripture or not, right? I think most of us can pretty well recognize if the Scripture or not, okay? The saints, the writing of the saints can also be a helpful option, right? The church has recognized that these people are outstanding in holiness, right? So we already know they're in heaven and they lived holy lives, so probably their writings are great, okay? And then just quickly, the sound of the music, right? Noble and beautiful, when you hear the music, would you describe it as noble and beautiful? Music at Mass should reflect the beauty and mystery of God. Again, the heavenly liturgy, right? The angels and saints who are present here. The very sound should communicate the truth of what is happening at Mass, okay? So, for example, if we've got hip-hop music that's telling us about the body of Christ and the Eucharist and whatever, but the music maybe isn't communicating to us the heavenly liturgy that's happening right now. Maybe we shouldn't choose that one. And I, and I don't really think anybody does, right? They, it's pretty well clear in that example. Others are more subtle, okay? But just, is the sound noble and beautiful? Does it communicate this amazing truth that God is coming to us, okay? Eternal, okay? In the Mass, we enter into the heavenly liturgy, and the music should reflect that truth. We should be attentive not to choose music because it is entertaining or sentimental, because it quickly goes out of style. Okay, and this, I think, is so telling of some of the things that are happening, is that, that it leads people to believe that the Mass itself could go out of style. Okay, and, and I, here I'm not saying anything bad about any style of music, but it is true that if um, we're hearing music that speaks to us of a particular decade, <laughs> 
you know, and that could be any of the decades, right? That can communicate even subconsciously, like, wow, this is something that it can also go out of style, right? So there are, I think, like, for example, like, well, anyways, I don't really want to give particular examples, but I think we all know of hymns that are so ancient, but also so fresh, you know, that have stood the test of time, okay? Um, eternal, universal, and again, and I love this so much, because I think this says so much, right? The elderly man who lost his wife and the young couple rejoicing in the birth of their new child should both be able to pray with the music at the mass, okay? So if we just choose music because it fits a, per a certain feeling that we're having at the time, we're not encompassing the whole church, which is experiencing all the emotions, right? The Psalms show us how honest we should be with our Lord in all the emotions, right? And it's interesting because actually in Western music right now, we have the major minor keys, okay? So that's just in general, if we hear something in minor key, we think sad. If we hear something in major key, we think happy, okay? In the modes of chant, for example, or in like even ancient music of different, you know, of, it was more ambiguous, right? It jumps in from the happy feeling to the sad or whatever else. Um, But it was definitely, okay, yeah, no worries. If you, again, if you gotta go, we'll, we'll be wrapping up pretty soon here, okay? Um, but there, there are some songs, for example, that you can hear and it's capturing mis mystery and awe, okay, more than specifically sad or specifically happy, right? It, it contains both in a way that, for example, okay, I will just give an example. You don't have to agree with me at all, but like, for example, let all mortal flesh, um, keep silence, or what wondrous love is this, or even other polyphony like Secret Cherubus or O Manu Mysterium, O Great Mystery. Okay, these are all hymns that I would want for my wedding and my funeral, okay, because they embody um, joy and sorrow. It's like a, a, the deep, true joy that you can feel when you're celebrating and when you're mourning, okay, so universal, okay. And the last thing leads into prayer and communicates the text. The hymns should help communicate the text and aid people's prayer. The hymn should easily lead into the silent times of prayer and mass. Okay, so again, the whole purpose of all of this, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up with this, is again, our goal is to conform ourselves to the words um, and what's happening at mass, right? The heavenly liturgy, angels are, <laughs> saints are present, Jesus comes down to us, right? Our purpose with music is to help those who are present to exercise their royal baptismal priesthood, to offer themselves to join united to the Son in the prayer of the Son to the Father, right? Because we know, now we've been studying this, that the more we can enter into that prayer and help others enter into that offering of the Son to the Father, the more we transform the world, the more Christ-like we can be and allow others to be and the more we can transform the world, right? Um, so that's our goal here, to really just enter into this heavenly liturgy to bring about the redemption of the world, okay? There's so much more I could say about that, but I think I better stop because it is late and everyone needs to go home, all right? Uh, I don't, uh, does, I mean, does anyone have any questions or maybe we should just, maybe we should just end it, shouldn't we? Okay. Let's end with a prayer. I'm so sorry that Father had to leave, but I will do my best, all right? Thank you, ladies, and everyone listening, all right? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I praise and thank you for the gift of this time you have given us that we can uh, study and allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us through the scriptures, through your church documents, through your catechism, through the teachings of your church and of your saints. I just ask that you send down your Holy Spirit, that you enlighten it in us what it is you so desire us to know. And may you bless each of your beloved daughters gathered here and your beloved daughters and sons at home watching this. Um, and may we grow ever closer to you and may we ever enter more deeply into that prayer of, of your beloved son with you, God our Father. Um, and we ask this all through the intercession of Our Lady as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you everyone so much, really. I'm so grateful <laughs> for your amazing stamina. Okay, I hope you drive safe home and um, get a good night's rest. God bless you all.